Everyone, welcome back to Data Science One. Uh, today we'll be talking about data cleaning and exploratory data analysis, uh, or EDA. Uh, this is a, a really fun topic because we're beginning to move more into model building and, and prediction with real world data. Um, but though obviously we're uh, we're still very much connected with uh, with collecting the data, um, especially in data cleaning. So this is a, a a large topic in data science, um, the data collection and, and pre-processing, um, and, and I could talk at great length about this, but uh, the the trouble is uh, much of this is, is more of an art than a science um, and, and has to do with your specific data set and problem. Um, so I'll, I'll try to give some, uh, some broad, uh, broad advice, um, though so much of what makes this a, a time-consuming and difficult process kind of is the uniqueness of, of data cleaning and exploratory data analysis on, on each problem that you, that you have uh, in particular. So uh, starting from scratch, if you're you know, handed a bunch of data by some domain expert or go and collect uh, a bunch of data from uh, some website perhaps, um, where, where do you even begin to start? Um, so the, the process of cleaning the data and exploring the data are, are really one in the same um, in that uh, you have to explore the data to find out what you need to clean. Um, and as you clean more and more, you're able to explore more of the data um, as you can run more analysis on cleaner data. So uh, we, we have a, a number of reasons why we might do uh, exploratory data analysis and, and cleaning. Um, and, and we'll get into each one of those uh, as we go. Um, but the, the real key thing is you need to, to look for data um, and, and to come in, um, especially not really sure what, what you're going to find. Um, so uh, I'm slightly covering up the slide here, but, uh, but the, the quote is that the EDA is like detective work. Um, it's more of a, a, an attitude or a willingness to look for things um, more so than, uh, than kind of traditional hypothesis-driven uh, data science or modeling, where we're coming in with a, a specific uh, question that we're trying to ask in, in exploratory data analysis and what makes this unique to data science um, from, from some other areas of machine learning and statistics uh, is that it's, it's really open-ended, just looking for general patterns or, or peculiarities with a data set. So the, the textbook reading you guys did for today um, talked about uh, a number of key properties of EDA. Uh, I, I think this is a great place to start, though uh, certainly there's no one-size-fits-all uh, approach to EDA and, and data cleaning. So I'll roughly talk about some of these things, but, uh, but uh, I'll also go through some other unique aspects and uh, and, uh, and challenges that might practically come up um, and, and how to approach them. So one of the, the places that, that we'll start, just like the, the textbook did, is in the structure of the data. So uh, they, they talk about uh, creating uh, data frames that, that are uh, rectangular, uh, that are uh, our full tables. Um, and, and to even go one step beyond that, uh, I want to introduce the idea of tidy data. Um, so uh, tight, tidy data uh, is now a, a term for uh, a type of data organization um, that is supposed to be more efficient and, and more effective um, to be able to do data science on. Um, now this type of tidy data might feel very much like, like what you're used to, and, and hopefully that's the case, um, because this, this is kind of uh, over the last few years become best practice um, in organizing data, which is quite simply to say that uh, just like we, we've seen in Pandas um, and you've, you've seen in many other programming languages, um, that the, the values live within a table, um, and that table is organized by variables across the columns and observations uh, across the rows. Now, this might sound like something that uh, that is obvious that every data table already uses, um, but the the example from this paper, and, and I think it, you could find many others, uh, just looking at 
data analysis in news sources, for example, um, is that uh, the data isn't necessarily stored this way. Um, for example, here we have value ranges instead of variables across the columns. Um, and so to, to turn this into tidy, tidy data, um, we, uh, we just have two columns, but, but many more rows um, in, the, in the, the tidy data approach. Um, and you can imagine how uh, changing the shape of this, uh, of this table uh, can change the way that we do data analysis, but that some of the, the handy built-in tools uh, like, uh, like group by and pandas um, can let us uh, very easily analyze data, even if there's uh, multiple values of uh, each religion or, or income here. So uh, wh where to even start with, uh, with exploratory data analysis? So, so as we just mentioned, uh, the, the first place perhaps to start is to look at uh, tables. Um, often, uh, if we're pulling data from some specific source, there'll, there'll be uh, metadata around, um, or around that data set, and ideally even documentation uh, to tell you what the columns mean, uh, how the data was collected, uh, things that will give you a, a broader sense of uh, what you can expect within that data table. Um, there are also formatting things, uh, as you've seen in the reading, um, that, that may uh, affect how you uh, organize and store um, and, and bring up the data frames, uh, just getting them into uh, into pandas to begin with. The, the, the next thing and, uh, and what we think about a, a lot as data cleaning is to look at the observations. Um, so we, we've seen the, uh, the, the head function uh, to let you look at the, the first few rows. Um, similarly, looking at the, the last few rows can be, uh, can be helpful, especially if you've gone through and, and sorted uh, your data frame by the, the row or by uh, certain columns that, that you're interested in looking at. Um, it's a, a good way to get uh, an idea of some of the, the ranges and, and types of data. Uh, similarly, uh, the built-in pandas functions that describe your data um, will, will include the, the min and max values um, as well as some counts. Um, to, to generally count the missing values, um, the the simplest way uh, is is hopefully uh, your missing values uh, are easy to detect in that they're uh, they're not a number um, in the pandas array though that's not necessarily the case um, and we'll we'll see a couple examples of that throughout the the lecture here um, but uh, but looking for uh, rows that have many missing values um, so so that's to say. Uh, run a loop over over the rows of your over your the rows of your data frame looking for missing values, or similarly looking for the counts of missing values over your columns uh, might tell you something a little bit more structural and fundamental about your data set, um, and and especially uh, how you can uh, ignore rows or columns in a way that uh, that cleans up the rest of the data without having to uh, affect uh, any of the the clean observations that you have. Uh, similarly, looking for for simple things like like duplicate observations um, will uh, is sometimes uh, harder to do, um, but uh, but but is a, a good step to do also in in early data cleaning. The interesting part here that starts to get towards uh, the feature engineering and and thinking about model building a little bit more particularly uh, is looking at the variables. Um, and especially the values of those variables. So the, the simplest case is, uh, is uh, to, to think about um, the metadata and documentation around the variables, uh, especially the, the variable names uh, is uh, frequently a challenge in practice where names are often abbreviated. Um, and uh, in, in well-documented cases, you can go in and look up what the abbreviations mean, but uh, practically uh, one of the pains of doing data science is, is going back again and again to the domain experts and asking them 
what it is they actually meant when they recorded uh, some particular column. Uh, thinking about analyzing the, the values within each of those variables, um, this is done similarly, though with slightly different uh, calls and, and tools, uh, thinking about uh, categorical versus uh, real valued variables. Um, so when we think about categorical variables, uh, one of the, the nice things to look at is the, the set of unique values. Um, so pandas has a, a unique function. Uh, similarly, Python has a, a set function. Um, they'll get, both of those will give you the, the set of unique values. And, and to look uh, at, at bar plots um, that count each of those unique values is a, a nice way of figuring out what exactly is in your data set. So for example, uh, if uh, we're looking for uh, the, the set of unique values um, on uh, a data set around college students, you can imagine that uh, the, you, you can think of, of many different abbreviations um, and uh, in ways that uh, the different years might be entered, might be uh, full names, might be uh, abbreviations of punctuation without, uh, might be uh, numbers uh, for, for the number of years you've been in college. Um, and, and looking at these unique variables might tell you uh, just how, uh, how you need to combine them to, to make them uh, play nicely into a data set that, uh, that coherently makes sense. Um, the, the issue of missing values, like I said before, uh, sometimes can be uh, straightforward where all of the missing values uh, have a, a unique identifier. Uh, sometimes that's not a number. Sometimes, uh, in, the, in this case, we have a dash here for our missing values. Uh, but often, the what is often the case is that uh, the missing values uh, will need some data cleaning in themselves. That uh, that different people have entered in uh, missing values uh, without great instructions on how to do that. Um, or the missing values have been added uh, along the way on different pre-processing steps before the data's gotten to you, um, each of which have, have treated them slightly differently. Um, and so, so clearly uh, cleaning these down to something that looks more like the line above where there's just a, a single instance of uh, the missing value, uh, uh, missing value value, um, the, the dash here, um, is a great first step. Uh, similarly, looking at the counts of each value will tell you a lot about the data set. So uh, hopefully uh, we would only have a small number of missing values, for example, um, and, and relatively even distributions uh, across uh, the number of students in each year in a college. Um, but if you ended up seeing something like, uh, like this distribution where most of your data uh, showed incorrect or missing values, uh, then that might suggest that you have a, a data collection problem and, and going through the rest of the cleaning steps uh, won't really make sense right now because what you really need to do is, is go back to your data source and, and figure out uh, why the data wasn't being collected or what you can do to, to get the data that you actually need. Um, similarly, uh, if we look at uh, the uh, quantitative variables, uh, We've talked uh, about the, the describe function um, that gives you the, the min, max, and uh, mean or median values. Uh, the, the IQR is, is similarly a, a helpful one. Um, but we'll be talking a little bit more uh, about how to think about these in terms of uh, histograms. Uh, so, so a histogram is, is a great way to visualize 1D data. Uh, looking at two variables, the, the story is uh, very much the same with qualitative data. Um, we, we can really just look at, at uh, counts and associations um, excuse me, between, uh, between the, the variables. Um, with a, a qualitative and a quantitative uh, piece of data, uh, you, we can uh, split the data along our qualitative metric and, and looking at, uh, at histograms of the 1D quantitative data, uh, but most often we'll end up with, uh, with multiple quantitative values, um, in which case we'll want to look at a scatter plot um, for the, the correlation between those. 
which will tell us a lot about uh, the, the information that we have in our data uh, as, again, we start to think about model building. So uh, in terms of uh, EDA, uh, your, your best friends for sure are histograms and, and scatter plots. Um, and, and even on these uh, dummy uh, figures, we can get some, uh, some feel for what the underlying data might have in store. Um, for example, the, the histogram here uh, might suggest that even though this is just one, uh, one column in our data set, uh, maybe the multimodal uh, multimodal uh, distribution here would suggest that uh, that maybe we actually should be storing this as two separate columns. Maybe this is a, a unique data, um, or it, it could be the case uh, that there the, there's a and likely the case that there are two uh, disjoint uh, populations in our uh, in our model. And that's something that that we'll want to consider as we're thinking about how we uh, how we describe it and model um, the the individuals uh, that the data is being collected about. Similarly, the, the scatter plot, of course, uh, tells us uh, how much redundant information or how much related information that there is between any of our variables um, as we think about how to uh, build models that, that are most efficient and, and best able to, to generalize, which uh, we'll, we'll get into in a few lectures. So one of my favorite uh, approaches to thinking about uh, scatter plots and histograms is what we call a pair plot uh, that looks at the pairwise relationship between all of your variables. Um, so in this case, this is a, an example from the Kaggle reading uh, I, I posted on Blackboard um, about uh, house prices. Uh, so what you see along the, the main diagonal here, uh, running from the, the top left to the bottom right, um, is uh, where a variable is matched up with itself in this matrix. So for example, the top left uh, histogram uh, is the intersection of the sale price row and the sale price column. And so obviously there's just one variable we're looking at here. Um, and so they show the, the histogram of that variable. And then all of the, uh, all of the other data points uh, in below it in that column uh, or mirroring that to the right on the row uh, are the scatter plots uh, showing the relationship between these two um, these two pieces of data. Uh, so obviously um, these these uh, are symmetric and, and you could look at either the the lower triangular or upper triangular uh, matrix if you want. Um, but uh, but what we can see just looking at a, a kind of thousand foot view, uh, are what variables we might expect to be related to each other um, and, and even what type of variables that we have. So for example, uh, the third to last row, uh, you, you can see has very discrete uh, values, um, which uh, looking at the, the variable name is the number of bathrooms uh, in the houses for sale. Um, so this is a, a good way to, uh, to get a, a very broad level of view of um, what your your data might look like um, kind of all at once. Uh, a similar uh, approach with a slightly less overwhelming detail and, and easier to do at, at much larger scales uh, is just a correlation heat map. So uh, in the prior uh, figure, what we might care the most about is the, the correlation in our, each of those scatter plots. Um, and so by uh, simply just putting down the correlation coefficient uh, between those two, um, we can get, a, 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 again, a, a bird's eye view of uh, what the, the data set looks like in terms of, of how features relate to each other. Uh, so obviously the main diagonal, again, has all ones as each variable is perfectly correlated with itself. Uh, but you can see some examples of uh, redundant uh, data columns here. So for example, uh, the area in the garage uh, is very closely correlated to the, the size of the garage in terms of, of how many cars it fits. Um, just like the total uh, square footage of the house uh, correlates well with the, the square footage of the, the first floor. Um, 
So sometimes uh, that means uh, these variables uh, don't need to both be included in our data set. Um, sometimes they, they still do add value. Um, so it's, it's uh, good not just to compare uh, these little clusters you see around the main diagonal, but also to look at how, um, how other things co-vary um, co with, uh, with these metrics. Uh, uh, one more uh, example of this pair plot uh, that I really like. Uh, this is a, a default uh, plot in the, the Seaborn uh, plotting package uh, that we haven't talked about, uh, but, but builds on matplotlib, um, is a, a multivariate uh, pair plot. Uh, so uh, given the, uh, the knowledge of different clusters within our pair plot, uh, we might be able to, to say something about, um, in this case, this is a, a penguin data set, um, how the, the different variables uh, relate to the, the different species of penguins. Uh, so for example, you can tell um, that the, uh, the first column or row, the bill length is, is really nice at uh, separating out uh, one type of, uh, of penguin, um, but, uh, but the, the final three uh, columns or rows um, are, are much better at, uh, at, at separating out the, the third type um, in green. And so, uh, so oftentimes we, we won't have uh, information about, uh, um, about specific things that might be outcome variables from our models, but, uh, but certainly in this case, um, you could imagine that, uh, that uh, the species of penguin being observed probably is something that's, that's in the data collection. Um, and so we, we can see uh, how different variables interplay and how they might be uh, important for, for modeling, um, modeling some of these outcomes. Uh, going back to uh, some of the, the key points uh, noted in the textbook, um, another uh, feature that, that they, they said was important um, to think about is the granularity. Uh, so this is uh, the case of thinking about uh, what, uh, what in your population you're actually looking at samples or, or data uh, or a census from. Um, and, and whether that is information about each individual or subgroups or, uh, or information about the, the whole population um, that, that you might be looking at. So uh, a, a nice uh, example uh, of this uh, might be uh, tabular data that, uh, that has totals at the bottom. So for example, uh, we might scrape this uh, website to find out uh, year by year totals, um, and we might uh, automatically assume that the the first row is uh, our, our column headers, and we might uh, maybe assume that the last row could be uh, you know column totals. Um, but uh, you, as you'll see, the the second to last and fourth to last row, the last row, um, if we assume these are normal entries, you'll you'll see weird things like uh, like. Uh, Jordan playing a thousand games in a season uh, clearly doesn't make sense, um, and so uh, so thinking about uh, what uh, what rows or also what columns might be uh, groupings of individual entries uh, is is really important to think about uh, as you're analyzing the data. Um, th this uh, particular table is also I think insightful for uh, showing how. Uh, the, the first assumption about rectangular uh, data tables being important isn't always the case. So for example, uh, the 93, 94 year row just has uh, three cells in it. Um, and, and so if we were to try and, uh, and put this into a data table, we would get you know, lots, of, uh, lots of not a number um, autofill-ins. Um, or if we were processing this directly, uh, would get uh, errors from NumPy uh, saying that uh, that each of our row uh, row lengths don't match up. Um, so this is a kind of an obvious example of looking at at row by row statistics, like the number of missing cells in each row um, could tell you something about uh, about certain rows. 
um, or, or certain columns. Um, for example, the, the season or age column have no missing values at all, suggesting that, uh, that uh, years uh, still happen even if, uh, if uh, the, the player isn't playing. So uh, to, to take one step back from this uh, the sampling frame question uh, is uh, is to ask uh, like we did in in one of the very first lectures about uh, what sample we we actually are dealing with and how that represents uh, the entire population that we might want to be sampling. Um, so uh, we we when we first talked about this we were talking about best practices for. Uh, for uh, making samples. Uh, here we might think about uh, how this relates to the, the data that we're actually collecting um, and, and looking at within our data frame uh, after the fact. Uh, one of the, uh, the instances um, where, where samples could be very biased or we could have uh, high amounts of aggregation are time. Um, we can imagine uh, one of the uh, issues with time um, being that the time series can be looked at uh, on many different resolutions. Um, for example, you might collect weather data uh, on a, a daily basis in your regular weather, uh, weather app forecast, um, but you could also look at the, the hourly uh, forecast coming in, or if you were looking at a weather station, they might have you know, minute by minute or second by second data streams that, that you could be capturing and pulling a, a feed from. Um, but thinking about uh, about time uh, just from a, a data practicality manner, um, there there are also huge issues uh, with um, with just how time gets formatted uh, in in computer code. Uh, so in general, uh, there are standard date time formats, um, and the the date time library in Python is a is a good one to. Uh, transfer your data variables to um, whenever you're looking at a time series data or, or uh, data that has a time column. Um, you should look uh, when you're uh, uh, assessing time data uh, for odd values. Um, for example, uh, 1100. Uh, might be a, a default value um, that uh, could tell you that a lot of your events happened on January 1st, 1990. Um, or uh, or uh, January 1st, 1970 is also the start date for Unix time, um, which uh, is uh, very closely related to, uh, to how we think about time in, in most computational libraries, including date time. Uh, the simple formatting of um, of how different people or different places write write down dates um, can certainly mess you up. Whether that's standard or military time, or you know years at the beginning or end of a, a date, um, but there's also kind of higher level patterns that that are interesting to look at, uh, like periodicity um, that uh, that you could find from something like a, a lag plot that, that plots uh, one of your variables lagged in time behind the other for a, a time series. There are lots of examples of how uh, dates and times have screwed up uh, projects, uh, perhaps none bigger than, uh, than this one here, where uh, the uh, a review uh, paper noted that uh, you know almost thirty percent of uh, of articles that uh, looked at gene name extraction um, had their uh, their data stored in Excel files, um, and uh, and Excel has a really nice autocorrect feature that turns anything that looks like a date into a date. Um, so, for example. Uh, deleted esophageal, esophageal cancer one or DEC one looks a lot like uh, December first um, as a as a, a date time, um, and and this led to all sorts of of errors um, within uh, within uh, some really highly published work um, in the the genomics field. 
Uh, so this this gets to uh, to kind of the the broader uh, point about uh, data cleaning and, and EDA, which is just simply how much do you trust the data um, going into your your models or, or the rest of your analysis, um, or going back to to the domain experts um, and or the the data source um, and, and looking for more. Um, so we we talked a little bit about missing data. Um, and similarly, uh, we might uh, delete data that's even there if we think it's it's unrealistic or incorrect. Um, and this is often harder to find than missing data. Um, again, this is a, a, a case where depending on the type of data you have, uh, you'll have to look for different things and, and unique challenges will come up. Um, but certainly you can think of uh, values that just don't make any logical sense. Um, for example, a, a date uh, of when some event happened that, that's in the future uh, probably is a, a typo. Um, similarly, for locations that don't exist, um, counts uh, are, are often things that have default values in the negative uh, because they simply can't exist. I often use negative 999 as a, a default uh, number when entering data. Um, and if it's the case that uh, that, that um, doesn't uh, doesn't get re fixed or replaced. Uh, pandas won't consider that to be a missing value since it, it actually turns out to be a numeric uh, numerically valid number. Um, so so looking for negative counts uh, it can can show you where data is is missing. Um, names uh, are another one um, where. Uh, where there are is a, a great amount of human error in data entry, um, and, and sim similarly for uh, quantitative data, uh, large outliers um, uh, and similarly represent uh, data entry issues. So, uh, so thinking about uh, when we might catch some of these, uh, some of this is uh, you know just looking through your data. Um, looking at the, the head or the tail of your data sets, um, or depending on how patient you are, scrolling through uh, you know, in, entire entries, um, or looking at, at random points within the data set, random rows. Um, you, you might find this running things like, uh, like the set or unique function, looking for uh, the, the set of unique names. Um, especially when those are sorted, uh, sorted um, in alphabetical order, it's it's really obvious that misspelled names will often show up right next to each other. Um, or looking at the the counts of names that uh, if if names or text entries um, typically have lots of of uh, of entries, and then there's a few names that uh, maybe only have one or two, uh, that might suggest that uh, that that word has been misspelled. With uh, outliers, um, looking at the histograms is a, a great way to do this. Um, what uh, what constitutes an outlier um, is is maybe not quite so clear uh, as it is in in traditional statistics. Um, but I, I still tend to uh, myself follow the the typical outlier rules of if uh, if something's more than uh, one and a half times the the IQR. Um, the, the inner quartile range, uh, then we call it an outlier. Um, but uh, but I think that again that visualizing your distributions uh, is the the best way to to look at um, look at what what your data um, actually is telling you. So for example, uh, this clearly looks like we have an outlier here, but uh, with a, a very similar distribution um, and and. Uh, thus, a very similar um, z-score for that outlying point. Um, we would, uh, I would tend to say that uh, that the point on the far right of the right plot uh, probably is not so much uh, a specific outlier as maybe um, part of a skewed distribution, uh, where the the point on the left uh, it's a, a little bit harder to say. Um, and, and it's possible that, that that value might be ignored as an outlier, um, even though in this particular case, uh, there's you know quite good evidence that, that this is a real data point, um, just uh, unclear how much it represents a, a typical data point. 
uh there are uh some also dependencies to look at between multiple variables when thinking about what data doesn't make sense um so for example here uh if there's a, an age column and a birthday column that uh should be uh showing you redundant data um that and they don't match up that might suggest that uh, at least one of them has an error um similarly uh looking at uh, uh the outcome of a pregnancy test for example uh might uh might tell you when uh, a data point for example the last row uh is is entered incorrectly um on this point we'll we'll come back to this in just a second but you can also think of uh, how you can use the dependencies between rows to uh, to think about what uh, missing values might be. So for example, the, the second to last row has a missing value here, um, but you might be able to uh, infer quite strongly from uh, a different row what the, the answer to uh, what that person's sex is uh, should actually be. Uh, as I mentioned before, lots of spelling errors uh, can occur whenever data is entered by hand, which is quite often. Um, uh, similarly, there, there have been famous examples of, uh, of fields shifted by one um, or, or uh, summary statistics, uh, especially in spreadsheets, not capturing uh, the, the whole row or, or something like this. Um, where uh, where sometimes those types of errors are extremely hard to find, um, but uh, but I think you should th you should think about um, as uh, one off for indexing errors when a, a column just totally doesn't make sense. Um, we mentioned uh, default values before. Uh, a again, a, a good thing to keep in mind, um, especially when thinking about uh, about manually entered data uh, like text. Uh, we'll go in, a little bit into text analysis uh, later on in the semester, uh, but just a, an example here um, that uh, as scientists, we, we care quite a bit about the science of science. Um, and, and one of the examples that's always messy is, uh, is citing papers that uh, everyone has a, a different style uh, in which they cite or a, a different uh, uh, a different camp that they prescribe to in terms of the correct way to cite uh, cite papers. And here are examples of four different papers that, uh, of course, all are uh, exactly the same um, the same underlying text. And, and you can think of that uh, kind of both in in misspellings being uh, mistakes, or or similarly, uh, each of these are are one hundred percent accurate, but are just different ways of representing uh, the same underlying data. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, in thinking about how much do I trust this data, you can also think about, uh, you know, obvious uh, malicious attempts to, to falsify data. Um, so if, you're, uh, if your columns uh, often have, uh, you know, names like John Doe, uh, then uh, maybe your, your names aren't real. If, if the email addresses put in are... Uh, you know, fake at fake.com or are, look like keyboard mashing, uh, probably uh, another uh, good indication that, uh, that the data you have, even though it's totally valid in terms of a data type, uh, shouldn't be trusted. Um, there are uh, statistical ways of, of looking at data falsification too. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Benford's Law uh, that says that uh, for, for any real value, real world, real valued data set uh, that contains multiple scales, uh, if you look at the, the leading digit uh, across that data set, um, what you would expect is a, a higher distribution of the earlier digits, um, simply because of the fact that, uh, that uh, data is typically produced uh, through log scale processes. Uh, we have a, a log scale uh, uh, timeline here, um, and and on this number line, you you see that uh, looking at uh, at standard scale uh, standard scale number lines of, of log scale, that a lot more of the the mass of um, of this number line uh, occurs between point one and point two, uh, much more so than compared. To the the distance between 0.8 and 0.9, or similarly that uh, 
that uh, 10 and 20 on a log scale has uh, much more weight than uh, than 80 to 90. Uh, so so looking at uh, at underlying summary statistics of um, of quantitative data sets can be helpful and in, in things that uh, that look for fraud like uh, like um, voting records or uh, or tax evasion um, often uh, rely on Benford's, Benford's law um, on uh, on population scales. Uh, and, and perhaps most importantly of all, step zero before you get into any of these is, uh, is if lots of your data looks like it isn't making sense, um, just go back and make sure that uh, you've actually uh, loaded the data in the correct way and, uh, and that you, uh, you have pulled or downloaded the data correctly and, and understand um, you know, what uh, columns you're supposed to be looking at and, and what they're supposed to mean. Um, because uh, you know there's uh, overwhelmingly human error is uh, the the limiting factor here, and and that totally includes uh, human error from the data scientists as well. Uh, so just to to wrap up really quickly, um, there are lots of cases of um, of missing values or or incorrect values that that we should look at. Um, in terms of our data cleaning. So practically what do we do um, when there are uh, rows or columns with, with lots of missing data? The, the most common thing, uh, if you have the luxury of being able to, uh, to reduce the size of your data set is simply to drop the rows um, that have missing data um, or, uh, or the, the columns that have missing data. Uh, though uh, that that can be uh, a little bit tougher to do as there are usually fewer columns than there are rows in your data set. Um, a, a note of, of caution here is that as we talked about uh, inclusion uh, biases uh, in, in a, a previous lecture, um, you should make sure that by ignoring rows where uh, the, the a data point might be missing, we're not um, inducing some sort of bias um, in the, the types of individuals that are left in our sample. Um, and again, what, what that means and, and what sort of biases are important uh, depend on, on the question that you're trying to ask. Um, but, but you can Im imagine lots of examples where uh, a, a specific subset of the population might not have uh, a, a specific entry, um, like, a, like a, a home address, for example. Um, a, a, another uh, approach is instead of ignoring missing values, trying to fill them back in uh, to, to complete and, uh, and square back up your data set. Um, there are, are lots of examples of how to do this, each with, with pros and cons. Um, maybe the, the simplest uh, approach to this is mean imputation. Uh, which takes the, the mean across uh, all of the instances in uh, typically the column that you're missing um, and, and just inputs the average, um, the, the average uh, value uh, in the, the missing cell, assuming that on average people are average. Um, and, and you can do this through for your whole population, or if you know, uh, you know that uh, this individual belongs to to some subset um, that has uh, values of of one or more features. You can also look at subgroup means. Um, similarly to mean uh, imputation, uh, you can also uh, uh, shuffle the instances of uh, of entries that you have. Um, in in that column uh, and, and just pull out one similar to uh, to bootstrapping uh, where you assume that uh, a random pull from the underlying data set uh, is uh, correctly represents the proportion uh, of data points uh, or the proportion of rows that have that data point um, so so this is, this is to say that you're doing a probability sample based off of an underlying probability dis distribution, which is your existing data um, when you shuffle and, and pull one. Um, th this is nice uh, above mean imputation because 
uh, mean imputation could give you nonsensical values. For example, doing this on uh, on uh, integer values, like uh, like the number of bathrooms we saw before in the the house sale plot, um, that uh, that you might uh, impute, you know, two point three bathrooms in a house, which uh, which clearly would would not be a, a, a logical value. Uh, an another option that uh, gets slightly more sophisticated is, uh, like we said, that uh, that different subgroups or different features uh, might be more closely related to uh, the the row that you're missing, and you might want to do mean imputation on a subgroup. Uh, you can think about that uh, about taking that one step further and saying that uh, that many or all of the columns um, that you have data for inform. Uh, what the the value of the missing column should be, um, and you can build a model of what you expect uh, the entry for a given column to be, uh, assuming that you know the other columns. Uh, so this is uh, is modeling missing values, uh, or, uh, or or more practically, uh, we might do this not just as a single model, but but as lots and lots of models um, that we'll call uh, iterative imputing. Um, which is to say, uh, we we uh, slowly get closer and closer to uh, an answer that, that makes the most sense, um, and and this uh, we can do through uh, packages. Uh, we haven't yet introduced uh, Scikit-Learn, uh, which is a, a nice uh, machine learning package uh, in in Python. Um, but uh, but just to jump ahead for a second uh, to show you that uh, um, an iterative imputing. Or, an iterative imputer, as complicated as that sounds, is uh, is actually a very simple thing to implement uh, with the right packages. So the uh, the final note um, I'll leave you with is uh, just that what you should be doing along this whole process is keeping notes. And you can think of lots of reasons why this could be important. Um, that you you might want to share this data um, publicly with folks. Um, the, like the stakeholders that are asking you to do this analysis or like readers of the scientific journal where you're trying to publish this work. Um, and obviously they want to be able to understand and, and replicate what you're doing. Uh, this is important because uh, depending on what sort of pre-processing you do, uh, you may and likely will end up with slightly different answers in, in your data analysis and model building later on. Um, and so, the, to be able to qualify what outcomes and solutions you get based off of what type of pre-processing you did to get there uh, is an important part of, of the, the scientific and, and data science communication process. Um, and, and maybe most practically of all, uh, chances are uh, at some point you're going to want to uh, do this process again. Uh, maybe from scratch on the same data, looking at, at a slightly different problem, um, or maybe uh, that you collect or, or receive more data and, and want to apply the same analysis uh, to, uh, to new or similar data. Um, it's, it's really important to know all of the pre-processing steps that, that you apply. Um, and, and when doing this in something like uh, an IPython notebook that's, uh, or, sorry, in, in an IPython terminal, um, where you're uh, where you're able to very quickly look at lots of things and and perform transformations pretty easily um, on your your data, uh, it's it's quite easy to lose track of of all of the things that you've done in your data cleaning and exploratory data analysis, uh, which is one of the things that I like most about the the Jupyter notebooks is that uh, while they run quickly. Uh, in, in real time, like interpreted Python does, uh, you're able to, to save the notebooks at the end like you would uh, with compiled code. Um, and, and so you have a track record uh, all the way along of, of all of the steps that you took and all the, the visualizations that you made uh, along the way. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, uh, please keep notes to all of the pre-processing that you do. Um, and uh, more practically for this class uh, in your, your class projects, you'll be expected to, to write that up as, as part of your work too. Um, so I know this was a, a bit of a longer lecture, uh, but there are is a, a lot uh, a lot to, to go over in this uh, in this area. And 
there is, of course, much more that I've, I've failed to talk about with, with EDA and cleaning, um, even in the, the time we had. Um, but uh, but to, to summarize uh, really quickly what we did talk about here, um, that, uh, that the idea here is to not come in with a specific hypothesis, but to, to really do an open exploration of the, the data and the metadata um, that, that you're coming in with. Um, which is to, to say, uh, not only do we look at the, the structure and organization of the data itself, um, but also of each of the, the variables um, and, and attributes um, as, as individual uh, variables and also as, as codependencies and, and covariances over our data set. Um, along the way, it's extremely helpful uh, whenever possible to look at summary statistics uh, or to visualize the data. Um, this uh, this uh, is a nice way to um, be sure that you have data that uh, is clean enough to visualize itself, but also to, to pull out anomalies um, that, that you might see looking at accounts or distributions um, and, and to apply uh, transformations or, or cleaning processes along the way. Uh, most of all, uh, you know, keeping a, a track record of, of all of this as you go. Um, so, so hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of an idea of, of what goes into uh, exploratory data analysis and, and data cleaning. Um, again, this is one of the things where you kind of just have to, to get your hands dirty and play around with it. Um, so hopefully uh, seeing the, the code in the readings uh, was helpful to, to go through a couple examples in the textbook. Um, and, and similarly, this is something that we'll, we'll get a lot of hands-on practice with uh, throughout the semester leading into your final project too. Uh, so thanks for uh, sticking it out through a, a bit of a longer lecture today um, and I'll uh, see you all in class.